Hello and welcome to a Lent Challenge and Chapter 5 of St Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to be giving my own explanation and interpretation of the three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. Today I'm beginning with chapter 5, next week I'll deal with chapter 6 and then in the third week chapter 7. By then we'll be coming towards the end of the challenge so in the last week I'll try and round things off. Uh, and so today we're dealing with uh, chapter 5 and so we'll go straight into it. I'll be looking at my notes from time to time, I hope you don't mind that. You can split the first chapter, this chapter 5, into two parts really. The first is the uh, verses 1 to 16 and then the second part is verse 17 and uh, to the end. So the first uh, part begins with the Beatitudes. Uh, those uh, tells us those who are blessed in the kingdom of God. And what I think it means more than anything else is that those people we see in those people who are blessed, in Jesus' description of those who are blessed, those who are most open to the Holy Spirit, those who are most open to God working in them, those who are uh, pure in heart, uh, those who are uh, poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who mourn for their sinfulness and for the way of the world. It's in those that the Holy Spirit has the greatest uh, freedom. It's in those people that the Holy Spirit uh, can work freely. It's in those people that the Spirit isn't grieved. Jesus said that we must not grieve the Holy Spirit in the things that we do and say and think. And it's in, so it's in those people who are blessed that the Holy Spirit is working best of all, Jesus tells us. Now we might think that that's a position of uh, weakness. But in actual fact, I believe that it's a position of strength. Because after all, if those are the people he, in whom the Holy Spirit in whom God is working best of all, as it were, then that surely is a place of strength because it's the same God, the same Spirit, that raised Jesus from the dead. It's that same God, the same Spirit, that created the universe. It's the same Spirit through which Jesus and the Apostles themselves healed people and raised them from the dead. And so you can see that rather than it being a point of weakness, it's actually a position of strength and power. And Jesus asks that we all become like that. Most of all, being open to the Holy Spirit, being open to God working in us, so that we can become what he goes on to next in the next couple of verses after the beatitude salt and light to the world when we think about salt we think about it being uh, a preservative we think of it adding flavor to uh, our food enhancing the actual flavor of the food itself and so christians are meant to be you and i are meant to be like that salt uh, enhancing society if you like, uh, adding something to it that helps it to continue and to develop and grow in the right way. And then this image of light, if we are to be like that, like that salt, we're also to be like a light to the world, shining forth God's uh, goodness, God's graciousness and God's love. That's why we are to be a light, because it sh we shine forth in the world and to the world. Not that people will see the good things that we do, not that they can see that we are being uh, uh, something that enhances society, but in seeing what's happening, they'll actually give glory to God. 
that's the end point that people should give glory to God. Now the second part of this uh, first chapter uh, from verse 17 until the end we have a change of emphasis and we can put it like this we begin it like this when uh, Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt to into the promised land under that commission of God it wasn't just a matter of getting from A to B from Egypt to Canaan what God wanted, I think, more than anything else, was to forge together a people of his own. To gather that people together and provide the bonds that, and, and re, in re, their relationships with one another and with God that will, would mark them out as the people of God. The problem was that they found it so difficult to become that people of God. God gave them the Ten Commandments through Moses to help them gel together, to help them build those relationships with one another and with God. And we know that, first of all, the most important relationship, uh, top of the list, is relationship with God. And then the rest of the commandments describe relationship uh, with one another. Now they found it so very difficult to do this, so very difficult to keep those commandments and so because of this they wandered around for 40 years in that desert in that wilderness and in fact it was just the next generation that went into Canaan the original generation all died before the people went into the promised land the reason being that they found it so difficult to come together as the people of God they could actually see the promised land from where Moses led them, but they couldn't go into it because they hadn't become that people of God. Now, we th when we think about Jesus in the wilderness for his 40 days and 40 nights, I think that reflects something of what was happening in the wilderness with God's people. Jesus in the wilderness for his 40 days and 40 nights is coming to terms with what it means to have that relationship with God and what it means it would mean for him to have a relationship with the world, with people, with other people. And it's interesting that, uh, that uh, it's the Holy Spirit that leads him. In fact, I think uh, I read somewhere that the Greek term the, that's used in St. Mark's Gospel in particular is that the Holy Spirit ejects Jesus into the will into the wilderness and so he spends that 40 days and 40 nights thinking about his relationship with God and his relationship with people his relationship with world and how that should uh, that should be shown as it were when he begins and continues his ministry and this 40 days of Lent is something like that for us we too are meant in this 40 days of Lent, above all else, to think about our relationship with God and our relationships with one another. And this next part of the Sermon on the Mount is all about that because Jesus comes and says to people that the law is here and it's here to stay. And he actually, in the way that he is, in the life that he's leaving, he, leading, he's the fulfilment of the law. In him we see what it means to actually keep the law in the way that God wants us to keep it. And he goes on then to describe what the law means in its depth. It's not just a matter of keeping these rules and regulations about our relationships. But he reminds people uh, in the way that he gives his interpretation and extends, in a sense, each of those laws that he's talking about. He shows that what, what matters more than anything else is our integrity in our relationships, the integrity of them, and our faithfulness towards one another and to God in our relationships. Those are the things that, above all, are meant to be seen through those laws. And we see how Jesus, in a sense, reinterprets those laws, extends the meaning of those laws so that they, it touches on the, our 
integrity and our faithfulness in our relationships with God and with one another. I think that, that really that's what this part of the Sermon on the Mount, the second half of chapter 5, is really all about. The integrity of our relationships and our faithfulness towards one another in our relationships. And that we ought not to uh, cause anyone to be grieved or to sin or to be in a worse off position in our relationships, whatever the law says, we shouldn't um, make it possible for anyone to be worse off in their relationships with one another by adherence to the law. Indeed, adherence to the law for Jesus is all about, as I said, integrity and faithfulness in our relationships. And then he gives us uh, three uh, amongst this uh, second part, he gives us three uh, indications, uh, practical indications of what that means. And they're very much steeped in the culture of the time. Uh, he talks about being struck on the face. Now, if you, if you think about it, if you strike someone on the right hand and you're right-handed, you've got to give them a backhander. You've got to slap them across the face with the back of your hand. And even in those days, it was an insult to do that. And so Jesus says, uh, if you're being insulted like that, turn the right cheek also. Under the Roman occupation, uh, <clears throat> the one thing that you couldn't be sued for out of all your possessions, out of all your wealth, was your cloak. Because that was the thing, the, the sort of final uh, thing that could be taken for you. That's the one thing that protected you against all the elements was your cloak and so someone could sue you for everything that you had but they had to leave you with your cloak. So Jesus says if someone sues you for your coat give them your cloak as well. Give them all of you got, all that you've got in your relationship with them. And then finally that third one, go the extra mile under the Roman occupation, a Roman citizen could sort of commandeer someone's horse and cart and get them to take them a mile, uh, to, to carry them a mile, um, but no further. So Jesus said that if someone uh, asks you to take them a mile, go with them an extra mile as well. So I think that we can uh, see from that that Jesus is asking us not just to go beyond what we are called to by God, but in a sense stand on our dignity with God. The right sort of dignity, showing that God, it's God that upholds us above all else. God in the depth of our heart, soul, mind and spirit that upholds us. It's in him we live and move and have our being. Thank you for watching. I hope it's been helpful. Please do remember to like and share, share above all this video. It'll be going on locusts and wild honey. So please do share it as far as you can to spread the word far and wide. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.